Hi, I'm Kat and today I have for you a true crime case. I also have a word in Romanian and I'll also be doing my makeup at the same time. So, let's start with the word in Romanian. Quasta de fildesh. Quasta de fildesh. Quasta de fildesh. Quasta de Fildesh. Well done, guys. You just said Ivory Coast. I want to start this video with a quote from Neil Gunham, King's Council, the council to the inquiry that followed. Quote, the food would be cold and would be given to her on a piece of plastic while she was tied up in the bath. She would eat it like a dog, pushing her face to the plate. Except, of course, that a dog is not usually tied up in a plastic bag full of its excrement. To say that Kao and Manning treated Victoria like a dog would be wholly unfair. She was treated worse than a dog, end of quote. And guys, just so you know, this is not a horror movie. This was Victoria's life before the 12th of January 2001 when Victoria's great aunt Marie Therese Caio and Carl John Manning were convicted of her murder. Now before I start with today's video I need to give you a trigger warning. This is just brutal, truly heartbreaking and if you are familiar with the case of Baby P, this is way worse than Baby P. This involves torture and also the death of a child. And I just want to point this out. This happened before baby P, so all the hopes that powers that be truly learn from a tragedy are just shattered because Victoria's case proves that nothing whatsoever was learned. Not only that, but you need to ask yourselves, was this lack of response from all authorities racially motivated? And I think that by the end of the video you'll get your answer and I also want to apologize it will seem like a lot of timeline jumps but uh, I tried my best to keep it as clear as possible and uh, also yes finally I managed to get a memory card for my camera so now I'm using again the professional camera which is just great just amazing because the angle was all off the sound wasn't really great and yeah overall it wasn't great so yeah i'm really happy that i finally managed to get a new memory card victoria ajo Klaimi was born near abujan in abobo on the ivory coast on 2nd of november 1991 to her parents Bertie amoisi and francis Klaimi. She was the fifth of seven children and she seemingly had a healthy and happy childhood. She started school when she was six years old and she was a very intelligent girl and really articulate. She was just a child who stood out. Marie Therese Cao was Victoria's father's aunt, so let's just say that she was Victoria's great aunt. She had been living in France for a few years she actually had French citizenship, but she went back to visit the Ivory Coast to attend the funeral of her brother, so she also went to see Francis as well in October 1998. Marie had wanted to take a child to France with her to essentially, you know, give them a better education and a better life. She initially chose a girl called Anna. She even got a passport done for her, but Anna's parents had second thoughts, so in the end, Anna didn't go, but Marie decided to ask about Victoria and Victoria was really happy to be chosen. She was a clever girl, so I'm sure that education meant everything to her. It's possible that the reason Victoria's French passport used by Marie and her to enter the UK had the name Anna because it was initially intended for the other girl. Anna was also the name by which Victoria was known throughout her short life here in the United Kingdom. I know what you are probably asking yourselves. Why did Victoria's parents allow her to leave the Ivory Coast? Well, there were not so many opportunities there and entrusting children to live with relatives in Europe is not uncommon to the society that Victoria's parents lived in. And I am sure that this is the case with many other foreigners who emigrate from various countries. 
Europe can offer financial and educational opportunities which are just not available on the Ivory Coast. After leaving her parents' house, Victoria traveled to another part of the Ivory Coast where she stayed with Marie's brother and around November 1998, both Marie and Victoria flew to Paris, France. Victoria spent around five months in France, possibly living in Rue Georges Meli Villepint. I'm, I'm not even sure if that's the right pronunciation, but I'm going to say it again. Rue Georges Meli in Villepint, which was the address given by Marie later on to Ealing Social Services shortly after their arrival to the UK. However, on other occasions, she would give a different address in Tremblay and France. There is not a lot of information about Marie's background, but it seems that she was married at one point, but divorced her husband, who later passed away in 1995. According to French social services, before Victoria got there, Marie lived with her three sons, claiming welfare benefits. Shortly after her arrival in France, Victoria was enrolled at the Jean Moulin Primary School in Villepinte. However, by December 1998, Marie began to receive formal warnings from school about Victoria's non-attendance, which is always, always a red flag. If you know anything about child abuse cases, then you know that these children tend to be isolated and usually the first course of action to isolate them is removing them from school. It became so serious that by February 1999, the school issued a child at risk emergency notification. I just, I, I just can't imagine how devastated Victoria was that she couldn't attend school. She was just so excited to go to France, get a great education and learn something that she really loved. After the school notification, a social worker became involved and she reported a difficult mother and child relationship between Victoria and Marie. But I mean, mother and child, that wasn't entirely accurate though, because they were not mother and child. Some of Victoria's absences from school were justified by medical certificates, all of which said she needed to rest. But when Victoria was at school, staff were worried about her tendency to fall asleep in class and because of this, the school formed the view that Victoria was clinically unwell and being monitored and treated by doctors. Marie mentioned to the head teacher, Monsieur Donet, that Victoria was suffering from some kind of a dermatological condition but as you will see later on, that dermatological condition was actually Victoria having hot water poured on her face and body. In the spring of 1999, Marie gave the school notice that she was removing Victoria so she could receive treatment in London. The home address of Esther Aka was given as a forwarding address. Esther was actually a distant relative of Marie's and they had been in and out of contact for the previous two years. When Victoria went to say goodbye to her classmates on 25th of March 1999, the head teacher, Monsieur Donet, noticed that Victoria's head was shaved and she was wearing a wig. I guess that, you know, you can see where this is going, right? The school becomes suspicious, social services are aware, so Marie is removing Victoria from school, even from the country, to get away. And poor Victoria, she had such a lovely hair. She just loved her hair, she really did. And now, Victoria's head is shaved. Before leaving, for quite some time, Marie had been claiming benefits in France that she was not entitled to. The French benefits agency was trying to recover money for these benefits and maybe this was another reason why Marie decided to leave and uh, go to the UK instead. On 24th of April 1999, Marie and Victoria boarded a flight from Paris to London. They traveled on Marie's French passport in which Victoria was actually described as her daughter. This is just my opinion. So I think that Marie was claiming benefits for Victoria as her daughter in France. But like I said, this is just my opinion. 
the picture in the passport was not of Victoria, but the picture in the passport was of Anna. Remember the other girl who was supposed to travel with Marie, but then changed her mind? The girls didn't really look alike, so maybe that Victoria was made to wear a wig, so she looked more like Anna. I mean, we just don't know. Marie and Victoria traveled as EU citizens, so there is no immigration record of their arrival. However, the date they traveled is confirmed by the airline ticket, which was later shown to Ealing Social Services by Marie as proof of her identity. She also gave documents from the French travel company that arranged the trip. When they arrived in the UK, Marie and Victoria went to Acton and moved into a double room in a bed and breakfast in Twyford Crescent. The reservation was made in France and lasted until the 1st of May 1999. At around 4.30 p.m. on 25th of April 1999, Victoria and Marie showed up unannounced at Esther's house, Marie's distant relative. Esther had just come home from work when she heard the doorbell ring at her house in Hanwell, West London. Victoria was introduced to her as Anne. Even though Esther was quite surprised by this visit, she invited both of them in. The first thing that Esther noticed about Victoria was that she was wearing a wig, which was noticed by her daughter as well, Grace Kansa, who joined her in a visit to see Victoria and Marie later that day. Grace removed Victoria's wig and she realized that she had no hair and her scalp was covered with patchy marks. She also thought that Victoria looked quite small and frail, but apart from that, they didn't notice anything inappropriate or unusual in Victoria's behavior or in her interaction with Marie. The next day, Marie and Victoria visited Ealing's homeless persons unit because they needed somewhere to live when their week in Twyford Crescent ran out. They were provided with accommodation in a hostel situated at Nickel Road, Harlesdean, and they moved in around 1st of May 1999. Over the next few weeks, Victoria and Marie attended Ealing Social Services quite a few times to collect substance payments and on one occasion to complain about the standard of their accommodation. A few of the Ealing staff who saw Marie and Victoria together in May 1999 noticed a difference between Marie's appearance and Victoria's appearance. Marie was always really well dressed, however, Victoria was always quite scruffy. Deborah Gant, who saw the two of them together on 24th of May 1999, went as far as to say that she believed Victoria looked like an advertisement for Action Aid. In the first month that they lived at the hostel, it's not really known what Victoria was doing because during this time, Marie didn't bother getting her into school or any kind of daycare activity and also Ealing Social Services didn't really make any effort either. It also seems that Victoria didn't have any friends or playmates. At this point, Victoria is 8 years old and she has no friends, she's in a foreign country, away from her family on the Ivory Coast and she's not attending school either. On 8th of June 1999, Marie took Victoria to a GP surgery on Acton Lane, Harlesdean. She was seen by the practice nurse, Grace Moore. The nurse didn't carry out a physical examination of Victoria because she was reported not to have any health problems or complaints. She felt there were no child protection concerns that required follow-up or reporting to other agencies. Shortly afterwards, Victoria started showing what appeared to be early signs of deliberate physical harm. Esther, who didn't see Marie or Victoria for six weeks, bumped into them on the street around 14th of June 1999. Victoria was wearing a dress with long sleeves only having her face and hands exposed. Esther noticed a fresh scar on Victoria's right cheek, which Marie said was caused when Victoria fell on an escalator. Later that same day, Victoria met Carl Manning for the first time. He had been driving a bus boarded by Marie four days before and the two of them got into a conversation. 
According to Carl, he gave Marie his phone number and she called him a few days later inviting him to visit her at Nickel Road, the hostel. It seems that this was the start of their relationship. At this time, Esther was so concerned when she saw Victoria on the street that she paid a visit to Marie on 17th of June 1999. She believed that the accommodation at the hostel wasn't really suitable for a child because it was dirty, cramped and with barely anything in there. Victoria seemed to have lost weight as well. A Ghanaian man was also there and he actually told Esther that he was concerned about the way that Marie was treating Victoria. The next day, on 18th of June 1999, Esther made the first anonymous call to Brand Social Services. By the middle of June, Victoria was spending the majority of her days being looked after by Priscilla Cameron, an experienced but unregistered childminder. Marie had gotten a job at Northwick Park Hospital on the 8th of June 1999 and that's where she actually met Priscilla. Victoria's history was taken by Dr. Rice Bainon at the Central Middlesex Hospital on 14th of July 1999 from Priscilla's daughter Avril. Priscilla had been caring for Victoria for the previous five weeks. Usually Victoria would get there around uh, 7 in the morning and she would be picked up in the evening sometimes as late as 10 p.m. Whilst Priscilla was taking care of Victoria, she was really nice and generous with her. Victoria would watch TV, she would draw, play, and she would often take a nap after lunch. Her English improved and she struck up a good relationship with Priscilla's adult son, Patrick, whom she showed how to dance. Priscilla provided all her meals on the days Victoria came to stay with her, but Priscilla didn't really like the way Marie was treating Victoria. She noticed that Marie would often speak very harshly to Victoria. On one occasion when Priscilla told Marie that Victoria would uh, sometimes move household objects around when she shouldn't, she was shocked to hear Marie shout at Victoria that she was a wicked girl, something she repeated on numerous occasions. Her unease was increased by a conversation that she had with a woman she referred to as Nigerian Mary, who asked Priscilla what did she say to Marie to make her beat Victoria every night. Priscilla and her son noticed Victoria becoming very quiet and reserved when Marie arrived at the house to take her home. She would look down at the floor rubbing her hands together whenever Marie was there. A few times Victoria turned up at Priscilla's house with a number of small cuts to her fingers. When Marie was questioned about them she said they were caused by Victoria playing with razor blades. Patrick also noticed marks to Victoria's face even though these were not serious. He thought they could have been caused by, by you know, childish rough and tumble. Marie's relationship with Carl developed very quickly. On 6th of July 1999, Victoria and Marie moved into his flat at 267 Somerset Gardens. The flat was actually just a small bed seat. There was a separate bathroom and a kitchen area, but only one room for the three of them to sleep in. The bed seat had two sofa beds. Carl said that Victoria slept on one of them and he and Marie slept on the other. This continued until October when Victoria's sofa bed was thrown out and she began to spend her nights in the bathroom. Victoria's physical abuse increased considerably soon after she moved into Carl's flat. Both Esther and Priscilla saw marks on Victoria's face and fingers before July. But the injuries that she was suffering from when she turned up at Priscilla's house on the evening of 13th of July 1999 seemed to have been quite different. According to Priscilla, Marie was really agitated when she turned up on her doorstep that evening. Marie asked Priscilla to take Victoria for good because apparently Carl wasn't prepared to tolerate Victoria living with him. Priscilla refused but she agreed to take Victoria in for just one night because Victoria was looking really ill. Marie gave her two large bags filled with Victoria's clothing. When 
when she arrived, Victoria was wearing a baseball cap pulled down over her brow. Her son, Patrick, also noticed three circular marks on Victoria's lower right jaw, which to him looked like injuries that were healing for quite some time. They both noticed Victoria's bloodshot eyes and Priscilla also saw a loose piece of skin hanging from Victoria's right eyelid. Priscilla asked Marie who burned and beat Victoria up. Marie said that all of Victoria's injuries were self-inflicted. Later on, Carl, Marie's boyfriend, gave a different explanation. He said that Victoria began to suffer from urinary incontinence very soon after she went to live in his flat and because of this he started hitting her. He began by slapping her but by the end of July he started using his fist. Priscilla gave Victoria a clean pair of pyjamas and then put her to bed. Later in the evening she heard groaning coming from her room and went in to see what was the matter. Victoria was asleep but Priscilla noticed that her face was swollen and her fingers were oozing pus. So she called her daughter Avril to go and have a look. They agreed that Victoria had to be taken to the hospital. The next morning, Avril took Victoria to see Marie Kader, a French teacher at her son's school. She wanted to discover the cause of the injuries as well as to get them treated. The teacher noticed injuries to Victoria's face and fingers, but Victoria didn't really want to talk about how she got them. Now, if you are wondering why did Priscilla take Victoria to the school teacher rather than the hospital directly, just keep in mind that, you know, Victoria spoke French and he, she was just learning English. So I suppose that uh, the French teacher would have been the better option to kind of get more information out of Victoria before being taken to the hospital. So the teacher told Avril that she should take Victoria to the hospital. She was taken to the A&E department of the Central Middlesex Hospital around 11 a.m. on 14th of July. Victoria was seen by Dr. Bainan within an hour of her arrival. He took a history from Avril together with the results of a basic examination of Victoria. This concerned him enough to refer Victoria to a pediatric register. In his view, there was a strong possibility that this was a case of non-accidental injury. The pediatric register who saw Victoria next was Dr. Ekundayo Ajayi Obe. She performed a more physical examination and discovered a large number of injuries to Victoria's body which she recorded on a set of body maps. She formed the view that at least some of Victoria's injuries might be non-accidental. She arranged for Victoria to be admitted overnight and called Brand Social Services to inform them. The police were also told and Victoria was placed under police protection at 5.20 p.m. Marie wasn't allowed to visit Victoria unsupervised. That evening Marie discovered from uh, Priscilla and Patrick that Victoria was admitted to the Central Middlesex Hospital. Obviously she was agitated and quite displeased by this. She went to the hospital and was there when Dr. Ruby Schwartz saw Victoria as part of her evening ward round. As a result of her examination that evening, Dr. Schwartz concluded that Victoria was suffering from scabies. Because of the infectious nature of scabies, Victoria was nursed in isolation for the rest of her stay on the ward. Victoria was extremely distressed to see Priscilla leave earlier that evening, but then she seemed to settle down. And apart from wetting the bed, she had a fairly un eventful night. The next morning after the police withdrew their protection, guess what? Marie returned to the hospital and she left with Victoria. The first agency they visited on leaving the hospital was Ealing Social Services Acton Area Office. Marie left Victoria in the waiting room on her own for more than one hour much to the annoyance of a social worker named Pamela Fortune. They spent that night in a hotel in Wembley before returning to Somerset Gardens the next day to Carl's flat. On the way, they stopped off at Priscilla's house to collect Victoria's clothing. Priscilla tried to speak to Victoria, but she wouldn't answer her. 
Patrick was also there and he noticed that Victoria seemed completely different from other times he saw her. She wouldn't smile at him and she didn't respond when he said hello to her in French. Marie and Victoria left and apart from one occasion when Priscilla saw Marie and Victoria walking together down the street, the Camerons never saw either of them again. Uh, just over a week later, on 24th of July 1999, Victoria was back at the hospital. This time it was the North Middlesex Hospital and it was Marie who brought her in. And uh, just a side note, my husband used to work at North Middlesex Hospital in London. Actually, he was working in the a &E department, he was a phlebotomist there, but uh, this was, you know, later on, not at the time of uh, Victoria's death. Victoria's most urgent injury was a serious cold to the face, which Marie said was caused by Victoria placing her head under the hot tap in the bathroom to try and relieve the itching caused by scabies. According to one version of the events described by Marie, she was asleep in bed at around midday when she heard a scream coming from the bathroom which woke her up. Victoria's burns were so severe that she was admitted to the pediatric ward, known as Rainbow Ward, where she stayed for the next 13 nights. So, just think about this, 13 nights, 1, 3, 13 nights, can you, can you just believe it? And honestly, I doubt that an 8-year-old would hold her head under the hot water tap to inflict those severe injuries to herself. Uh, it, it just seems, the story just seems completely unbelievable. At around 11 p.m. on 24th of July 1999, Simone Forley, the senior house officer who first examined Victoria, explained the position to Herringay Social Services. A more detailed referral was made three days later by Karen Jones, an Anfield social worker based at the hospital. As a result, a strategy meeting was held at Herringay's offices on 28th of July 1999 and Victoria's case was allocated to a social worker called Lisa Erterwory. A number of medical staff who cared for Victoria during her stay on the Rainbow Ward noticed marks on her body which they considered were signs of serious deliberate physical harm. Nurse Beatrice Norman saw what she believed was a belt buckle mark on Victoria's shoulder and nurse Millicent Graham noticed a mark which made her suspect Victoria was deliberately burned. Nurse Grace Pereira who baited Victoria the following day saw marks which led her to believe that Victoria had been hit with a belt and also beaten. It seems that Victoria started to suffer serious deliberate harm by late July 1999. This was also indicated by her behavior when Marie and Carl came to visit her on the ward. She gave the impression of being frightened of them. When Marie came into the ward, Victoria changed from being lively and vivacious to withdrawn and timid, and the relationship between her and Marie was recorded in the world's critical incident log as being like that of master and servant. On one occasion, she was seen to wet herself while standing to attention in front of Marie, who was sitting down, who was apparently telling her off. Victoria's reaction to Carl when he came to visit was also similar. He said that Victoria seemed wary of his presence and was anxious to keep her distance from him. Neither him nor Marie ever brought Victoria anything in terms of clothing, food, snacks, toys or treats throughout the time that she stayed in the hospital. When Marie was not around, Victoria enjoyed her time on the Rainbow Ward. She became a favorite to several of the nurses, including uh, nurse Lucien Taub, a French speaker whom Dr. Mary Rositer, the hospital's named doctor for child protection, asked to befriend Victoria. Victoria liked to dress up and she was given clothes to dress up in by the nursing staff. Nurse Lucien Taub would take Victoria to see the babies in the neonatal ward and bought her sweets and treats. Nurse Sue Jennings said, quote, Victoria 
did not have any possessions. She only had the clothes that she arrived in. Some of the staff had brought in dresses and presents for Victoria. One of the nurses had given her a white dress and Victoria found some pink Wellingtons which she used to wear with it. I remember Victoria dressed like this, twirling up and down the ward. She was a very friendly and happy child, end of quote. According to Dr. Mary Rositer, Victoria was a little ray of sunshine. Apart from Marie and Carl, the only other visitors Victoria received while in the North Middlesex Hospital were Mrs. Arthur Worry, the assigned social worker, and police constable Karen Jones. They went to see her on August the 6th, 1999, and after speaking briefly to Victoria, they decided it would be appropriate for her to be discharged back into Marie's care. Yes. After all of these injuries and so many staff members of the hospital clearly spotting abuse and evidence of bruising and injury, the police and also the social services still sent Victoria right back to her abusers. The very short time in her life in this country where she was safe, happy and well cared for ended when Victoria left the North Middlesex Hospital with Marie at around 8 p.m. on 6th of August 1999. They went straight back to Carl's flat in Somerset Gardens where Victoria spent the remaining seven months of her life. During the course of these seven months, Victoria's contact with the outside world was limited and rare. Professionals saw her only four times in seven months. The first two times were home visits made by the social worker Lisa Erterwory to Somerset Gardens. The other two times were at the beginning of November when Marie took Victoria to Herringay Social Services North Tottenham District Office. Here Marie made then later retracted allegations that Victoria was sexually harmed by Carl. No one from the Tottenham Child and Family Center to which Victoria had been referred to by Herringay Social Services on 5th of August 1999 ever visited Victoria at Carl's flat. Victoria was registered in uh, November at the health center that was approximately 100 yards for, from Carl's flat, but she never attended the center and none of the medical staff who worked there ever saw her. The first of Lisa's two visits to Somerset Gardens took place on 16th of August 1999, shortly after Victoria was discharged from the North Middlesex Hospital. She found her to be smartly dressed and well cared for. Victoria spent most of the visit playing with a doll, one of a number of toys seen by Lisa. Although Lisa didn't even talk to Victoria during this visit, she formed the impression that Victoria was happy and seemed like the little ray of sunshine described by the nurses. As far as Lisa was concerned, the priority was to move Marie and Victoria to alternative accommodation because she didn't think that their living arrangements were satisfactory. But Lisa didn't ask Marie how Victoria was spending her days at this stage. Victoria wasn't enrolled in a school and she didn't take part in any activities. Marie no longer worked at the Northwick Park Hospital because her employment was terminated due to prolonged absences. In July, just before Victoria was admitted to the Central Middlesex Hospital, Marie approached a man on the street and started chatting. They discovered that they both spoke French and the man, Julien Kimbidima, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing this, invited Marie back to his house so that she could meet his wife, Chantal. Marie visited them again on 2nd of August 1999 to celebrate their daughter's birthday and they struck up a friendship, especially Marie struck up a friendship with Julien, the man. Shortly after Victoria's discharge from uh, the North Middlesex Hospital, Marie took her to meet Julien and Chantal for the first time. Victoria seemed quiet and withdrawn, however, she did start to cry when Marie told Chantal that Victoria wasn't her real daughter. Marie complained to them about Victoria's incontinence, which seemed to have become quite serious. Julien and Chantal saw Victoria several times over the following months and Chantal sometimes looked after her when Marie was busy. 
when Victoria was at their house, instructed by Marie, she would sit quietly in the corner unless she was told otherwise. Once or twice she wet herself while at their house, but she was never incontinent of feces. According to Chantal, Marie would shout at Victoria all the time and never showed her much affection. At one stage, Marie told her that Victoria was possessed by an evil spirit. Towards the end of August, Marie had started to go to church. Since her arrival in the United Kingdom, she showed an interest in attending church. According to Pat Mensa, a Baptist pastor based at a church in Northwest London, Marie started visiting her church on a regular basis from the middle of May 1999. On 29th of August 1999, Marie and Victoria attended the mission in Sambal for Christ, a church which meets in a hall close to Borough High Street. The pastor here was Pascal Oron. According to him, despite the season, Victoria was dressed in heavy clothing that covered all of her body apart from her head and hands. He noticed wounds on both hands and advised Marie to cut Victoria's hair shorter so that the injuries to her scalp could breathe. Marie told him about Victoria's incontinence and he formed the view that Victoria was possessed by an evil spirit. He said that the problem can be solved with prayer. Honestly, honestly, I'm making these faces because I just hate when this happens. I am not religious myself and I really don't have anything against believers. You can believe in whatever you feel like, but I hate, I completely hate it when behaviors are blamed on the devil. Honestly, it's just nonsense, it's nonsense. Two weeks after her first visit to his church, Marie called Pastor Orome and told him that following a small improvement, Victoria's incontinence returned. The pastor criticized Marie for being insufficiently vigilant and allowed the evil spirit to return. The incontinence continued throughout the rest of September and in October, according to Carl, the sofa bed Victoria had been sleeping on was thrown out and that's when Victoria began to spend her nights in the bathroom. The bathroom in Carl's flat was small and the door opened out into the living room. There was no window and even though there was a heater, it was either broke or the heater was unused. When Victoria was inside that bathroom, the door was kept closed and the light was switched off. Victoria began to spend her nights alone, cold and in complete darkness. Just imagine there was no window in that bathroom. However, when Lisa, the social worker, visited the home on 28th of October 1999, she didn't notice anything unusual. This was her second visit to see Victoria and talk to Marie. Both of the visits were announced. The purpose of this visit was to explain to Marie that the housing application made after the previous visit in August was turned down and to talk about other options. Victoria was completely ignored during this visit as she sat on the floor playing with a doll. The fact that she was still not attending school was raised during the conversation, but there were no questions asked about how Victoria was spending her days. At his trial, Carl described the second visit as a put-up job. The flat was cleaned and tidied up in preparation for this visit, which seems to be consistent with Lisa's evidence. She said she neither saw or smelled any evidence of Victoria's incontinence. According to Carl, Victoria was told how to behave in front of Lisa. Victoria was said to be sleeping on the remaining sofa bed with Carl and Marie sharing a newly purchased bed on the other side of the room. At the end of the visit, Victoria suddenly jumped up and shouted at Lisa. She said words to the effect that uh, she did not respect her or her mother and that they should be given a house. This behavior really surprised Lisa. During the course of their conversation, Lisa told Marie that the council only accommodated children who were at risk of serious harm and, in the council's view, Victoria wasn't at risk. <laughs> you don't say. Within three days of this conversation, Marie contacted Lisa to make allegations which, if true, 
would have placed Victoria within that category. On 1st of November 1999, Marie called Lisa and told her that Carl was sexually harming Victoria. Lisa asked her to go to her office. Marie arrived with Victoria and Carl later that morning, but Lisa felt it would be better if Carl left. I don't even know why Carl was there in the first place when the accusation was against him, but anyway, Carl left. Marie then told Lisa about three incidents of sexual abuse. Victoria was then spoken to alone and repeated what Marie had said almost word for word. She appeared very anxious to be believed and both Lisa and the other social worker present, Valerie Robertson, believed that uh, Victoria had been coached. However, in Lisa's view, Victoria didn't seem to be a particularly nervous, frightened or fearful child on that occasion. Lisa came up to a short-term solution to deal with the sexual harm allegations and this was to arrange for somewhere else for Victoria to stay whilst the allegations were investigated. A call was made to Chantal, whom Marie identified as a friend who might be willing to help. Chantal, who didn't speak English very well, initially agreed, but later changed her mind having spoken about this with her husband. In the end, Victoria and Marie left the office in a taxi headed for the Kimbidima's house, Marie's friends, but by the end of the day, they were both back at Somerset Gardens at Carl's flat. The next day, Victoria and Marie returned to North Tottenham to withdraw the allegations of sexual harm. They spoke to Rosemary Cosinos, who told Marie that despite the retraction, she and Victoria would have to live elsewhere while the matter was being investigated. Marie told Rosemary that she and Victoria could continue to stay with her friends. But guess what? They returned right back to Somerset Gardens, to Carl's flat. This was the last time any of the professionals involved in Victoria's case saw her before her admission to hospital on the night before her death. Victoria made two trips to France towards the end of 1999. Carl, Marie and Victoria all went to Paris around 11th of November 1999 and they stayed for a long weekend at Marie's son's house where Victoria was allowed to sleep in a bed. A second visit to France was made at the end of November. Following her arrest, a Eurostar ticket in Marie's name was found at Carl's flat showing that she traveled to Paris on 29th of November 1999 and then returned back to the UK on 12th of December 1999. No ticket was found for Victoria, but Carl was clear that she went with Marie on the trip. They stayed again with her son. After returning to the United Kingdom in Carl's flat, Victoria continued to be forced to sleep in the bath and from November onwards she was tied up inside a black plastic bean bag to try and stop her from soiling the bath. There is evidence of this from New Year's Eve entry in Carl's diary. Yes, he actually kept a diary. And all this was detailed in his diary. Can you just believe that? Can you just believe it? In it, he describes an argument with Marie, which ended by her returning to his flat in order to release Satan from her bag. This torture meant that Victoria spent extended periods of time lying in her own urine and feces. In his interview with the police, Carl said that he and Marie became worried that the condition of Victoria's skin might cause social workers to ask undue questions. By January 2000, despite no longer being kept in a bag because of the corrosive effect the urine and feces had on Victoria's skin, she spent more and more of her time in the bathroom. Not only did she continue to sleep in the bath, but she also began to spend some of her days in it as well. Around 16th of January 2000, Julian, the friend, met with Carl and Marie at a tube station and they told him they left Victoria at home because her incontinence made it difficult to get things done. At the start of the new year, Marie and Carl began to serve Victoria her meals in the bath. 
This was done by placing the food on a piece of plastic or a plastic bag and placing it in the bath next to Victoria. She would usually be given whatever Carl and Marie cooked for themselves, but by the time it reached her, it was usually cold. Her hands were kept bound with masking tape, so Victoria was forced to eat by pushing her face towards the food, just like a dog. As well as being forced to spend much of her time in inhumane conditions, Victoria was also beaten on a regular basis by both Marie and Carl. According to Carl, Marie used to strike Victoria on a daily basis, sometimes using a variety of weapons. These included a shoe, a hammer, a coat hanger and a wooden cooking spoon. Cigarettes were put out on Victoria, she would be hit with the hammer over her feet and constantly beaten. The forensic examination of the flat after Carl's arrest revealed traces of Victoria's blood on the walls, on his football boots and on the undersole of one of his trainers. He also admitted to sometimes using a bicycle chain on Victoria. During the course of Lisa's visit on uh, 28th of October 1999, they discussed the option of returning to France. However, despite the two visits to Paris, Marie didn't really have any plans to return there permanently. Carl was under the impression that Marie's intention was to send Victoria back to her parents in the Ivory Coast, but despite his obvious dislike, for Victoria, he said he didn't push the issue. Victoria's parents were not contacted to see if they would be willing to have their daughter back, which I'm sure that they would have been, but they were also not told about Victoria's condition. Instead, Marie kept them in the dark. In early 2000, they received a Christmas card from Marie with several photographs of Victoria smiling. On the back of one photo was written in French, Quote, she's growing up well and she finds herself well, end of quote. Given the very limited contact that Victoria had with the outside world in the weeks leading up to her death, it's difficult to say the speed with which her condition deteriorated to the state she was in when she was admitted to the North Middlesex Hospital on 24th of November 2000. The pastor from Northwest London Pat Mensah recalled that Victoria seemed a bit poorly when she visited Somerset Gardens on 12 of February 2000. She was concerned about Victoria's health at this point, so much so that she advised Marie to take her to the hospital. She also advised her to take her to a church. By 19th of February 2000, Victoria was very sick. On this day, which was a Saturday, Marie took her to the Universal Church of the Kingdom of God housed in the Old Rainbow Theatre on Seven Sisters Road. This was the church recommended to her by Pastor Pat during the course of her visit earlier that month. Audrey Hartley Martin, who was assisting Pastor Alvaro Lima in the administration of the 3 p.m. service, noticed the two of them coming up the stairs. They were shouting at each other and Victoria seemed to be having difficulty walking. Marie and Victoria were disturbing the service, so Audrey took Victoria downstairs to the crèche. She noticed Victoria was shivering and she asked her if she was cold. Victoria replied that she wasn't cold, but she was hungry. Audrey gave her some biscuits and Victoria hid them in her pocket when Marie came down to collect her. Audrey didn't try to get her medical attention because according to her she was not aware that the child was ill. At the end of the service, Pastor Lima spoke to Marie about the difficulties she said she was having with Victoria, particularly her incontinence. He expressed the view that Victoria's problems were due to her possession by an evil spirit and said that he would spend the week fasting on Victoria's behalf. He made it clear that Victoria was not expected to fast herself. Marie was advised to bring Victoria back to church on the following Friday morning. According to Pastor Lima, Friday was the day on which prayers are said for deliverance from witchcraft, bad luck, and everything bad or evil. On the Sunday, Marie and Victoria returned to the church where they were seen by Pastor Celso Hunier. Victoria was quiet and well-behaved during the visit. 
On Wednesday, Marie called Pastor Lima in the evening and told him that Victoria's behavior improved in that she stopped covering the flat in excrement. On Thursday, Marie called Audrey, the lady with the biscuits, and told her that Victoria had been asleep for two days and didn't eat or drink anything. By the evening of the same day, Marie brought Victoria to the church and asked for help. Pastor Lima advised them to go to the hospital and the minicab was called. Mr. Salman Pinabarsi, the minicab driver, was so concerned about the condition Victoria was in that he instead took her to Tottenham Ambulance Station, which was closer. She was then taken by ambulance to North Middlesex Hospital and admitted to the casualty unit. On arrival, Victoria was unconscious and very cold. Her temperature was 27 degrees Celsius. In babies and children, the normal temperature is 36.4 degrees Celsius, which is a huge difference. Initial attempts to warm her up were unsuccessful and the pediatric consultant, Dr. Leslie Alsford, was called in to take responsibility for Victoria's treatment. Dr. Alsford arrived around midnight. Her examination of Victoria was limited because her first wish was to increase Victoria's temperature, which at this point was 28.7 degrees Celsius. Dr. Alsford later said, quote, I had never seen a case like it before. It's the worst case of child abuse and neglect that I have ever seen, end of quote. Dr. Alsford formed the view that Victoria needed the type of intensive care facilities unavailable at the North Middlesex Hospital. She tried to find space in another hospital and was eventually successful. A team from the Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at St. Mary's Hospital, Paddington, arrived at 2.30 a.m. Victoria was transferred to St. Mary's Hospital, Paddington, where she remained in a critical condition with severe hypothermia and multi-system failure. The medical staff were unable to straighten her legs. Over the hours that followed, Victoria suffered a number of episodes of respiratory and cardiac arrests. Her respiratory, cardiac and renal systems began to fail. At about 3 p.m., Victoria went into cardiac arrest for the very last time. CPR was attempted, but Victoria didn't respond to it. Sadly, Victoria was pronounced dead at 3.15 p.m. on 25th of February 2000. She was 80 years and 3 months old. A post-mortem examination was carried out the following day by Dr. Nathaniel Carey, a home office accredited pathologist. He found the cause of death to be hypothermia, which was caused by malnourishment, a damp environment, and restricted movement. He also found 128 separate injuries on Victoria's body showing she had been beaten with a range of sharp and blunt instruments. No part of her body had been spared. Marks on her wrists and ankles indicated that her arms and legs had been tied together. It was the worst case of deliberate harm to a child he had ever seen. In the end, Victoria's lungs, heart and kidneys all failed. What stood out from Dr. Carey's evidence was the extent of Victoria's injuries and the deliberate way they were inflicted on her. He said, quote, All non-accidental injuries to children are awful and difficult for everybody to deal with, but in terms of the nature and extent of the injury and the almost systematic nature of the inflicted injury, I certainly regard this as the worst I have ever dealt with, and it is just about the worst I have ever heard of, end of quote. About her 128 separate injuries, he said, quote, there really is not anywhere that is spared. There is scarring all over the body, end of quote. In the space of just a few months, Victoria was transformed from a healthy, lively and happy little girl into a hopeless wreck of a human being. I think the most painful is that Victoria's 11 months in this country, even towards the end, she could have been saved. In the last few weeks before she died, a social worker called at her home several times. She got no reply when she knocked at the door and assumed 
that Victoria and Marie just moved away. At that time, probably Victoria was in fact lying just a few yards away in the prison of that bath, hoping that someone might find her and rescue her before her life faded away. Marie was arrested on suspicion of neglect at the hospital at around 11.35 p.m. on 25th of February 2000. She told the police, quote, it is terrible, I have just lost my child, end of quote. Carl was arrested the following afternoon as he returned to his flat. On 20th of November 2000 at the Old Bailey, the trial into Victoria's death opened where Marie and Carl were charged with child cruelty and murder. Marie denied all charges and Carl pleaded guilty to charges of cruelty and manslaughter. The judge described the people in Victoria's case as blindingly incompetent. In his diary, Carl described Victoria as Satan and said that no matter how hard he hit her, she did not cry or show signs that she was hurt. Giving evidence in court, Marie, the first convicted murderer to give evidence in person at a public inquiry, ranted and raved that she was innocent, claimed that she was the victim of a conspiracy and even went to criticize Victoria's parents. In a chilling confession read in court, the bus driver, Carl Manning, told police, quote, You could beat her and she would not cry at all. She could take the beatings and pain like anything, end of quote. At his trial, Carl said that Marie would strike Victoria on a daily basis with a shoe, a coat hanger and a wooden cooking spoon and would strike her on her toes with a hammer. Victoria's blood was found on Carl's football boots. He admitted that at times he would hit Victoria with a bicycle chain. On 12th of January 2001, both of them were found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. The judge said to them, quote, what Victoria endured was truly unimaginable. She died at both your hands a lonely, drawn-out death, end of quote. Marie was transferred to Agent Prison Durham and Carl went to Agent Prison Wakefield. During her life in Britain, Victoria was known to four local authorities, four. Four social services departments and three housing departments, two child protection police teams, two hospitals, an NSPCC center and a few local churches. Victoria was buried in Grand Bassam near her hometown. On 20th of April 2000, the Health Secretary Alan Milburn and the Home Secretary Jack Straw appointed William Laming, Lord Laming, former Chief Inspector of the Social Services Inspectorate, the SSI, to conduct an inquiry into Victoria's death. Lord Laming was given the choice of staging a public inquiry or a private inquiry. He chose a public inquiry. It was the first inquiry to be set up by two secretaries of state. The inquiry was actually three separate inquiries together called the Victoria Climbing Inquiry as he had a statutory base of three pieces of legislation. Section 81 of the Children Act 1989 Section 84 of the National Health Service Act 1977 and Section 49 of the Police Act 1996. It drew together the involvement of social services, the National Health Service and the police and became the first three-party inquiry into child protection. The counsel to the inquiry was Neil Garnham, King's Council, and the counsel for Victoria's parents was Joanna Dodson, King's Council. The inquiry, based in Hannibal House, Elephant and Castle, London, cost £3.8 million, making it the most expensive child protection investigation in British history. The website victoriaclimbinginquiry.org.uk was created where all the evidence and documents were made available freely which are not available anymore there because I double checked and is nothing there. The, the page gives an error, the link. The inquiry was launched on 31st of May 2001 and was split into two phases. Phase 1 investigated the involvement of people and agencies in Victoria's death in the form of hearings. 270 witnesses were involved. Phase 1 hearings began on 26th of September 2001 and finished on 31st of July 
2002. It was originally supposed to end on 4th of February 2002, but late documents caused delays. Phase 2 of the inquiry taking place between 15th of March 2002 and 26th of April 2002 took the form of five seminars which looked at the child protection system in general. It was chaired by Ghanam and brought together experts in all aspects of child protection. Lord Laming's appointment was controversial as he had been director of Hertfordshire County Council Social Services Department in 1990, a department which was strongly criticized for its handling of a child abuse case and which had the local government ombudsman making a finding of maladministration with injustice against them in 1995. The father of the child in the case said of Laming's appointment, quote, I don't see how he has the qualifications or experience to be able to lead an investigation into another borough which has been failing to protect a child in exactly the same manner that his own authority failed to protect the child in 1990, end of quote. Liberal Democrat spokesman Paul Burstow said, the findings of the ombudsman in the Hertfordshire case must give rise to questions about Lord Laming's appointment to head this inquiry. And Conservative Party spokesman Lion Fox said, I think the government maybe should have thought twice about this and maybe even yet they will think again. The Department for Health, however, said that they were fully confident that he is the right person to conduct the inquiry. Several documents for the inquiry were submitted late or under suspicious circumstances to the inquiry. A report by the Social Services Inspectorate was submitted late because the Inspectorate presumed the document was not relevant to the inquiry. The report was produced in April 2001 but was not handed over to the inquiry until 2002, so it was only a year later. An earlier report by the Joint Review about Herringay Social Services, which was heavily relied upon during the inquiry, said that service users were generally well served. The report said that the former report presented an overly positive picture of Herringay Social Services, particularly children's services. Further documents were received late when Herringay Council handed in 71 case documents five months after the hearings began. Lord Laming said, quote, it shows a blatant and flagrant disregard to the work of this inquiry, end of quote. The people involved were threatened with disciplinary action. This was not the first time that Herringay Council did not produce documents on time, which led Lord Laming to say to his chief executive, it is a long, sad and sorry saga of missed dates and missed timetables. Garnham warned that Herringay senior managers who had access to the documents would enjoy an unfair advantage in the inquiry, but Lord Laming said he was determined that Herringay is not given an advantage. The inquiry found contradictory information in the NSPCC's files. One file said that Victoria's case was accepted for ongoing service, whilst another computer record made after her death said that no further action was to be taken, suggesting the possibility that records may have been changed. Documents given to the inquiry may also have been altered. The NSPCC provided photocopies of original documents which had alterations in them, saying that the originals were lost. However, the originals were later produced with pressure from the inquiry. The NSPCC held an internal investigation but found no evidence of deception. Oh my god, this color of lipstick makes my teeth so extremely yellow. Wow. It's just unbelievable. Sorry. The inquiry heard that many of the councils were understaffed, underfunded and poorly managed. The chief executive of Brand Council said its social services department was seriously defective. The inquiry was told that many cases at Brand Social Services were closed inappropriately because before inspection by the social services inspectorate that children were being placed unaccompanied in bed and breakfast accommodation and that children in need were turned away. The inquiry heard how Edward Armstrong had previously been ordered not to work with children over his handling of a case in 1993. Herringay and Brand councils diverted 
18.7 million pounds and over 26 million pounds in the two years 1997-1998 and 1998-1999 from its social services department into services such as education and for other purposes. Both underspent their budgets for children's services totaling 28 million pounds by more than 10 million pounds in 1998-1999 causing a deterioration of child protection services. The inquiry heard how Herringay Council failed to assign social workers to 109 children in May 1999, a short period before they took on Victoria's case. Again, in January 2002, Herringay Council failed to assign social workers to about 50 children. Herringay Council wrote a letter to Lord Laming claiming that social workers who gave evidence were being questioned more harshly than other witnesses. Lord Laming condemned the letter saying, quote, I will not tolerate any covert attempt to influence the way in which the inquiry is conducted, end of quote. Mary Richardson, the director of social services at Herringay, from 1st of April 1998 until 31st of March 2000, had been responsible for a restructuring of the department, which, according to the union, Unison, had virtually paralyzed the child protection service. She received contact from 12 senior practitioners and team managers criticizing the proposals as potentially dangerous and detrimental to the people to whom we offer a service. Mary Richardson provided no meaningful response to the memorandum. She did say, however, in the inquiry that the blame lay on part of all of the line management responsibility. Garbuk Singh, the former chief executive of Herringay Council, before becoming the chairman of the Commission for Racial Equality, said that there was nothing he could have done to prevent Victoria's death. Marie herself was called to the inquiry, becoming the first convicted murderer to appear in person in a public inquiry. She initially refused to answer questions and, when she did, protested her innocence, first in French, then raising her voice in anger in English. Giving evidence by video link from prison, Carl apologized for his actions and said that it was not the fault of the various agencies that Victoria died. <sighs> and I don't know, I don't agree with him. 100% I don't agree with him. Obviously, first of all, it was his and Maurice fault, but then also all the other public services involved. And we'll touch that a bit later on. Victoria Climby's parents gave evidence and were present at most of the hearings becoming distressed when hearing of Victoria's suffering and seeing pictures of her injuries. They blamed Herringay Council and its chief executive for her death. Lisa Arthurworry, a junior worker with only 19 months of child protection experience when she took on Victoria's case, was found to have made mistakes in the case. She accused her employer of making her a scapegoat and criticized her superiors and department for not guiding her properly. The inquiry heard that Lisa was overworked, taking on more cases than guidelines allow. Carol Baptiste, Lisa's first supervisor, initially refused to attend the hearings, but later gave vague responses to the inquiry and said that she had been suffering from mental illness at the time. Carol's own child was taken into care a few months before Victoria's death. Lisa said that in their meetings, Carol spent most of the time talking about her experiences as a black woman and her relationship with God rather than child protection cases and that she was frequently absent. Carol admitted she didn't read Victoria's case properly. She was removed in November 1999 when she was found to be professionally unfit for her job and replaced by Angela Mayers, who became Lisa's new supervisor. Angela was accused by Lisa of not maintaining childcare standards and of removing an important document which recommended that Victoria's case be closed from her file on 28th of February 2000, the day the news of the death was known, but of course she denied this. Angela said she didn't read Victoria's file. The inquiry heard that the number of child protection police officers in the Metropolitan Police Service was reduced to increase the number of murder investigation officers because of the Stephen Lawrence case in 1993. A detective inspector supervising six child protection teams in London at the time of Victoria's death 
wrote a report criticizing their competence. His former boss, however, claimed he had been lying when he said he only held purely administrative responsibility for the teams. The detective inspector was taken to hospital when a woman poured ink over his head while testifying. And uh, you can already see that it's kind of everybody blaming each other, you know, you, you never get any accountability and you never get one of them saying, yes, we made the mistake, yes, because of us, Victoria is dead, no. Everybody is just pointing fingers at other people, it's just completely disgusting. The new chief executive of Herringay Council, David Warwick, Carol Baptiste, the Metropolitan Police and the NSPCC apologized for their failings in the case, as if that makes any kind of difference. In his opening speech on 26th of September 2001, Neil Gannon, King's Council, said that race may have played a part in the case due to the fact that a black child was murdered by her black carers and the social worker and police officers most closely involved in the case were black. He said that the fear of being accused of racism may have led to the inaction. In the hearings, Lisa Arterworry, who is African-Caribbean, admitted that her assumptions about African-Caribbean families influenced her judgment and that she had assumed Victoria's timidity in the presence of Marie and Carl stemmed not from fear but from the African-Caribbean culture of respect towards one's parents. Red Nadat, director of the Race Equality Unit, now the Race Equality Foundation, a charity that provides race awareness training to social workers, later said, quote, the implicit message is that it's acceptable for ethnic minorities to receive poor services under the guise of superficial cultural sensitivity. This is absolutely shameful as it allows people to argue that good practice is compromised by anti-racism and contrasting the outcomes of the white and black staff members involved for a large number of black frontline staff if the finger of blame is pointed at them they don't end up in jobs in other local authorities that's how institutional racism operates end of quote Jackie Smith, the Home Secretary from 2007, said, quote, I have not seen widespread evidence that social workers are not taking actions and there are no cultures that condone child abuse. We are absolutely clear that social workers and social work departments have a responsibility to consider whether children are subjected to harm and if they think they are, to take action, end of quote. When both phases of the inquiry were completed, Lord Laming began writing the final report. The Laming report, published on 28th of January 2003, found that the agencies involved in Victoria's care had failed to protect her and that on at least 12 occasions, workers involved in her case could have prevented her death, particularly condemning the senior managers involved. On the day of the launch of the report, Victoria Climie's mother sang her daughter's favorite song as a tribute. The 400-page report made 108 recommendations in child protection reform. Regional and local communities for children and families are to be set up with members from all groups involved in child protection. Previously, each local authority managed their own child protection register, a list of children believed to be at risk, and no national register existed. This, combined with local authorities' tendency to suppress information about child abuse cases, led to the implementation of the child database. Two organizations to improve the care of children, the General Social Care Council and the Social Care Institute for Excellence, had already been set up by the time the report was published. Following Victoria Climie's death, the agencies in the case, as well as the child services system in general, were widely criticized. The health secretary, Ellen Milburn, said, this was not a failing on the part of one service. It was a failing on the part of every service. Lion Fox said Victoria's case amounted to a shocking tale of individual professional failure and systemic incompetence. Paul Burstow said there is a terrible sense of deja vu in the Laming report. The same weaknesses have led to the same mistakes with the same missed opportunities to save a tortured child's life. Labour Party Member of Parliament Karen Buck said the Bayswater Families Unit told me that there must be hundreds of other climbing cases waiting to happen. And the Victoria Climbing Inquiry highlighted how easy it is 
for vulnerable families to fall through the net, especially if they do not have English as a first language and are highly mobile. The 1999 Department of Health document, working together to safeguard children, set out child protection guidance to doctors, nurses and midwives. The Royal College of Nursing, however, said that there was evidence that many nurses did not receive proper training in these areas. Denise Platt, Chief Inspector of the Social Services Inspectorate, said doctors, police officers and teachers often thought their only responsibility was to help social services, forgetting that they had a distinct role to play. Mike Lidbetter, a president of the Association of Directors of Social Services, said that many health professionals were not engaged in child protection. After the inquiry, there was a feeling that senior managers had managed to escape responsibility and that only junior staff members were punished. Paul Burstow said the majority of children who die from abuse or neglect in this country know the perpetrator. It is within the family and by friends that most abuse occurs. As a society, we are still in denial about that hard truth. The Laming Report was criticized by Caroline Abrahams and Deborah Lightfoot of NCH Charity as too narrow, fo focusing too much on the particular case of Victoria Climie and not on general child protection. According to Harry Ferguson, a professor of social work at the University of the West of England, Laming's report focuses too heavily on the implementation of new structures and fails to understand the keen intuition that child protection work demands. He criticized the approach to, to child protection of focusing too much on the worst cases and trying too much to prevent them rather than having an approach that also celebrates success and said that focusing too much on any individual case and basing reforms on that was deeply problematic. Lord Laming responded to criticism by the Association of Directors of Social Services that his recommendations would require much more funding by saying that these arguments lacked intellectual rigor and he dismissed claims that his reforms would be too bureaucratic. The Guardian said that the report does not address the issues of frontline staff. Derek Mead of NCH said, I do believe that inquiry reports have made a positive difference to the child protection system and I have every confidence that Lord Laming's report will do so too. The Guardian discussed the media attention surrounding the case, noticing how sensational events received widespread coverage, yet important but less exciting events received less coverage. It states that only The Guardian and the Independent of the national newspapers gave significant coverage to the evidence in the hearings. A possible explanation is given as much of the evidence has been concerned with social services, which many other papers view as a politically correct waste of money for the undeserving. In August 2002, Carol Baptist was fined £500 after being found guilty of deliberately failing to attend the inquiry. Victoria's parents, speaking through a family friend, said, Quote, we, the family, expected her to be dealt with more severely. End of quote. This was the first time a person had been prosecuted for not attending a public inquiry. In September 2002, Lisa Erterwory and Angela Mayers were sacked following disciplinary procedures. The Education Secretary, Charles Clark, also added them to the Protection of Children Act 1999 list, banning them from working with children. In October 2004, Lisa Erthawory appealed against her dismissal, saying that she was duped by Marie and Carl, misled by medical reports, badly advised by her managers, and that she was a scapegoat for other people's failures, but the appeal was rejected. In 2005, she appealed a ban preventing her from working with children and she won the case. So she can still be working with children. In 2004, Angela Mayers appealed her ban preventing her from working with children and she won as well. This decision was challenged in the High Court but she prevailed. In 2004, six police officers involved in the case faced misconduct charges. All six kept their jobs and some received reprimands and cautions. In 2004, the General Medical Council dropped misconduct charges against 
Dr. Ruby Schwartz. Herringay Council held a debate in the council chambers to discuss the Laming report. The parents of Victoria Climey were invited to speak at the council by Councillor Ron Aitken, but the council leader, George Meehan, denied them permission. Only pressure from the opposition and local press got the decision reversed. As George Meehan only reversed his decision just before the meeting, a driver was rushed to Acton to escort Francis and Bertie Climey and Mordium, their interpreter, to the council. At the meeting, the Climeys attacked the council through their interpreter for its handling of the case, especially in its dealing with the Laming inquiry. Mordium, the translator, later went on to be the director of the Victoria Climey Foundation. The government placed Herringay Social Services Department under special measures requiring close supervision by the Social Services Inspectorate. Allegations emerged that in 2004 and 2005, senior managers at Herringay Council ignored child abuse cases and became hostile against a social worker who sought to expose the abuse. Victoria's Climby's parents created the Victoria Climby Foundation UK, a charity that seeks to improve child protection policies, and the Victoria Climby Charitable Trust, an organization to build a school in the Ivory Coast. They are also involved in championing many child protection reforms.
A playwright, Lance Nielsen, wrote a play based on the events staged at the Hackney Empire throughout 2002. After Victoria Klein is dead, commentators discuss the history of child protection and the various abuse and death cases, noting that there have been 70 public inquiries into child abuse since 1945 and comparing Victoria Klein's case with that of many others, especially that of Maria Corwell in 1973. They pointed to the many children abused and killed by their guardians over the years and how the agencies involved in their care let them down. They noted similarly that their deaths also led to inquiries and reform policies, reforms that have not saved the many children killed following them. They pointed out that an average of 78 children are, are killed by parents or minders every year, a figure unaltered in the 30 years since Maria Corwell's death provoked the first criticism of communications failure. They expressed cynicism towards the possibility that these reforms would be different. Dr. Chris Hanvey, director of operations at Barnardos, for example, said, quote, Victoria's tragic case is the latest in a sad roll call of child deaths, each leading to fresh inquiries and a new but recurring set of recommendations, end of quote. Ian Wilmore, former deputy leader of Herringay Council, said, the script for this kind of inquiry is now almost traditional. The minister goes on TV to insist that this must never happen again. Responsibility is pinned on a few expendable frontline staff, all conveniently sacked in advance. Criticisms are made about poor communication, with earnest recommendations about better coordination and possible restructuring. Council officers, all new appointments, go on TV to say that everything has changed since, since the case began. Everyone looks very earnest. Voices crack with compassion. Nothing essential changes." End of quote. In the United Kingdom, the Audit Commission regulates social services. John Seddon pointed out in the Times that Harrogate Council was rated four star at the time of Victoria Climis and Baby P's deaths. Victoria Climis' death was largely responsible for various changes in child protection in England, including the formation of Every Child Matters program, an initiative designed to improve the lives of children. The introduction of the Children Act 2004, an act of parliament that provides the legislative base for many of the reforms, the creation of Contact Point, a database designed to hold information on all children in England and Wales, which is now no longer in operation, and the creation of the Post of Children's Commissioner, who heads the Office of the Children's Commissioner, a national agency serving children and families. It was clear from the evidence heard by the inquiry that Victoria's intelligence and the warmth of her engaging smile shone through, despite the horrific facts of what she experienced during the 11 months she lived in England. Victoria was a lovable child, but sadly her intelligence and loving nature didn't stop her from dying a slow, lonely death, abandoned, unheard and unnoticed. Between the end of April and early July 1999, Marie attended Ealing Social Services on no less than 18 different occasions. She was accompanied by Victoria on at least 10 of these visits. Together they had dealings with six social workers, one group support assistant and one housing officer. Yet, by the time Ealing closed Victoria's file on 7th of July 1999, they knew virtually no more about Victoria than when Marie first visited the Ealing Homeless Persons Unit on 26th of April 1999 to seek help with her housing needs. And this is the truly tragic story of Victoria Climy, the 8-year-old girl who excitedly left her parents on the Ivory Coast for a better education in Europe, but she never knew a day of happiness. She was abused by Marie long before Carl came into the picture and she was let down by everyone, absolutely every single institution that was supposed to protect her. But she was sent back time and time again and simply just ignore. How could, how could a normal person, how could anyone with a bit of common sense believe Marie that Victoria had a dermatological condition? Look at her photos. 
it's clear something else was going on. She went from this to this in the space of a few months. How can they believe that this is from a dermatological condition? And again, we hear about reports, inquiries, investigations, new laws, strategies, recommendations, blah, 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 blah. And we get to a few years later, 2007, that baby P is killed and the same Herringay Council is involved. Was anything learned? <laughs> Clearly not, clearly nothing was learned because it's just like Ian Wilmore said, it's just a script, but in essence, nothing ever changes. And we not only have Victoria Climbing with failures, upper failures, we have so many other children before her, after her, so many others. Arthur Labinho Hughes, Star Hobson, Logan Mwangi, and these are just three children. How many more are being failed every single day by these services which never seem to follow anything really? Was this, was this racially motivated? I absolutely believe it was. But obviously, of course, this is just my opinion. After all the research that I've done, I absolutely believe that this was racially motivated. I think that the fact that Victoria was a foreigner and black as well, she was seen differently and she was also treated differently. And I also think that they, yeah, she was treated differently, she was seen differently, she wasn't given as much importance as she would be given if, uh, say for example, she would be white British or if, say for example, she would be born here in the UK and you could, you know, hear her speaking British English or, you know, being a different uh, skin color. I'm not, uh, I'm not saying 100% that the skin color was the issue, but I think that the main issues were the fact that she was a foreigner and English was not her first language. And then, of course, as well, that the skin color plays a role as well because people just assume something based on your skin color. They assume something about your culture, they assume something about your um, tradition, they assume something about your behavior, and so on and so forth, if you get what I mean. But in my opinion, definitely, the, the race played a huge role in this. And just think about it, guys. Just think about it. All of the possible institutions were involved in Victoria's case. All of the possible institutions which deal with child abuse were involved and all of these institutions failed miserably to stop Victoria from dying. And all of these institutions and agencies, social services, the police, the hospital, the healthcare system, the GP, the doctors, the nurses, the social workers, every single one of them plainly, stupidly, in my opinion, turned a blind eye and decided that they don't need to save a girl, a little girl, because not only was she eight years old, but she was also a foreigner who didn't speak English. And this is, this is the way that I see things, being a foreigner myself as well. And... Uh, Probably a lot of people were thinking, heck, if she can't learn English, then, you know, why the hell should I be dealing with her? Because she doesn't speak English. She should speak English because she's here in the UK, right? Yeah. It's very frustrating. Uh, it's very... It's heartbreaking. Not only it is frustrating, it's heartbreaking. And also, it's angering and irritating because you have all these people who clearly see signs clearly see signs of abuse and yet that decide that it just needs to be ignored. Why? I mean, there were a couple of, uh, you know, medical staff at the hospital who were dealing with Victoria, who really took care of her. And obviously I am not going to include every single person who was dealing with Victoria in the stupid people kind of behavior, but 90% of them did just that. They just plainly, stupidly ignored a little girl. Again, allegedly in my opinion, just because she is not British. This is my view. I know some of you will come for me in the comment section down below, but honestly, if you are not a foreigner in another country, then you will never understand how foreigners feel like 
in a foreign country. So as much as you say that, uh, you know, us foreigners, we are exaggerating or whatever else we are doing, you don't know how a lot of actions makes foreigner feel, foreigners feel unless you are a foreigner living in a foreign country. Because that's the only way you are able to see the difference of how you are treated from how others are treated, right? I'm just going to give you an example because we are at the, you know, at this subject just quickly, like uh, two or three seconds. My husband, like I mentioned, he used to work at non-middle sex hospital and he used to work in, uh, you know, different hospitals in, um, in London. And uh, he started off from a healthcare assistant and then she, he went up to being a phlebotomist in the a &E department. And uh, he was taking care of a lot of people, all nationalities, any skin color, whatever. It didn't matter. A person who is sick is a person who needs treatment, right? Regardless of their name, skin color, race, whatever, whatever, regardless. And obviously that he's being being a foreigner he speaks english the way that he speaks and with an accent obviously and uh, any any english born person would be able to realize that hold on a minute he's a foreigner because of his accent right and he would be helping this uh, old guy out because he was very sick and he was i think even changing his clothing because he was urinating in the bed and as my husband was cleaning him up he told my husband that he should go back to his country, which I think it's no, it's not frustrating. It's uh, not only heartbreaking, but it's also saddening because you have a human being helping you when you need help. And the other person doesn't really see you as a, an English person or, you know, a person born in uh, Britain or in the US. They see you as a human being who needs help. So they are helping you. And you, whilst they are helping you, you say to them, go back to your country. When they are there and they are helping you for your own health. It just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me. And I'm sorry if I'm offending a couple of people, but again, I'm saying I'm not trying to make this about me or about foreigners in general, but this is my experience and this is what I have observed and this is my husband's experience as well, being foreigners in the UK. And uh, that's why I'm saying that uh, in a sense, I can see and I can understand why Victoria would have been treated differently by 90% of the people that she was dealing with. And that's one of the other reasons why I think that she was simply just ignored. She was just ignored because otherwise, how can you explain why all of these institutions are being involved in her case and they are seeing her and they are seeing her injuries and they are seeing that she's just not okay and they simply just don't do anything. Okay, social services didn't do anything. Okay, the hospital didn't do anything. Okay, how about the police? Why didn't the police do anything? Someone, someone, at least one single person, if they would have done something, this 80-year-old girl, she would have been alive today. Instead, we are here talking about her case and uh, inquiries and the learnings that should have been made. And then yet, just a few years later, baby P is next and so many others and this is a never-ending story and i can go on forever you know rambling about this because this is a never-ending story and is never going to end and nothing is ever going to be learned and children will keep on dying because we have ignorance working in positions where children should be protected yet they are not Thank you guys so much for watching today's video. I'm sorry, but it really, really frustrates me and irritates me so badly when these things are happening. Anyway, if you're interested in any of the makeup that I use for today's video, all of the products are linked in the description down below under the video. And I also take any case suggestions. So if you have anything in particular you want me to look at, just leave any detail you have in the comments under the video and I'll do my best to try and get the case covered for you. Thank you so much for watching. For now, take care, stay safe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.